that mountain. But Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. And Moses represented what? The law. The law of Moses. Yeah. And Elijah represents Prophets. Prophets. Yeah, very good. So what chapter of Mark has a discussion of marriage and divorce in it? Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Well, you're close. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And when you study that, it's a good thing to also compare that with Matthew chapter 19, first nine verses of that chapter, or the first through, yeah, let's see, oh, well, deep into that chapter. <laughs> uh, that, that also helps with an understanding of uh, Jesus's discussion. Okay, um, what is it that stood between the rich young ruler and eternal life? His riches. riches. Yeah, his riches, or uh, chapter 10, verse 22 says it was his possessions. So his things, right? His things. He had great possessions, according to that text. What? What unusual request did James and John make of Jesus in Mark chapter 10? Uh, why not to sit on the left and the other one on the right hand? That's right. Very good. Okay. Sounds like you must have been in class. You've studied a little bit, read through it with me. Yay! Good job. Uh -huh. All right. So today we're going to begin in Mark chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 12, a pretty unusual story that's related to us, but I think it's I think it's like several of those stories that just have an unusual little twist in it. And I, that is, I think there's more to it. There's there's a, a larger teaching that's going on here than just the event itself. I think we're we're being told something about Jesus's impression about the people of his time. So Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, at first sight, to me, this is a puzzling sort of miracle. Um, Passover was not really the season for figs, and even the text indicates that that is true. Yet because the Son of God looks over there at that fig tree and it sees that it has leaves on it, it is as though the fig tree is saying, hey, look at me, I've got leaves on and maybe I have some fruit too. It's not the time for it to have leaves. It's not the time for it to have fruit. But the idea here is that it's it's like it's pretending to be fruitful. I guess that's what I'm getting at. So when Jesus didn't find any fruit, he used his divine power, a miracle, to destroy the tree instead of helping it to become fruitful. And it seems to me like this is almost uh, an object lesson, a, a sermon in a figure. So here's this tree, which if if you will, it, it represents the nation of Israel. It acts like, it tries to present the idea that it's healthy and producing fruit, but upon closer examination, it's not bearing any fruit at all, certainly not to the glory of God. 
uh, what what's the hindrance there? Well, of course, it's not the season. <laughs> it's not the time for it. But, you know, sometimes sometimes trees were not able to produce fruit because the roots were dead um, because of not having proper nourishment or receiving the, the rain. Um, maybe it was dry. The idea is that, you know, Israel would present itself, and especially with these religious leaders that were so prominent, chasing Jesus everywhere. It's like they presented one thing, but upon closer examination, they were not producing fruit. They were, in reality, spiritually dead. Now, it was interesting when Jesus came in with his, what, what we tend to refer to as the triumphal entry, that we saw him go in into the city. Then it says that, you know, he he went by the temple and kind of surveyed everything, and then he left. I thought that was interesting from the standpoint that when you read Matthew chapter 21, Jesus goes into the city, has the triumphal entry and all, but then he goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple. What we find out here in Mark is that actually this was the next day. So what Jesus did was he came into the city, kind of looked at what was going on with the temple complex and everything. He went to Bethany, and now he's coming back to Jerusalem. Verse 15, so they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now, a couple of things I wanted to note with you that, you know, Jesus is driving driving out the money changers. And um, wh what the situation was is there were several courts in, in the temple, several meeting areas. Those areas that were most restricted were relegated to Jews themselves, but the outer courts, there was actually an area for Gentiles. And the idea seemed to be that the Jews who were meeting in the innermost parts, they could actually associate with any of the Gentiles that had entered into the Gentile courts and, you know, um, demonstrate how great God is in some senses, evangelize the Gentiles. You, you know that Gentiles could be proselyted. That is, they, they could um, become a part of the worship of God uh, through uh, Jewish worship. And so here was an opportunity to reach out to people. But Jesus comes in and he sees that in this area that typically uh, was designed for effectively for evangelism, is not being used for that. It's actually being used to, to sell uh, maybe doves or, or other animals for worship practices. Maybe some, you know, I guess at the heart of it, certainly at the start of it, was the idea, well, we've got people traveling here to Jerusalem and maybe they didn't bring what they needed for worship. And so we'll just set up a little business here. It'll just be a matter of convenience. People can come in and just bring money with them on their trip. They can buy what they need for their sacrifices, and it'll be a public service. That might have been the idea in the beginning, but eventually it became a situation where people were actually making money off of worshipers. It wasn't just a matter of convenience, it was a matter of business, trying to make as much money as you can. And so that had become such a business that it had crowded out that area. And any Gentile that would have wanted to come in there to know more about God or to witness the righteousness of God's people, well, they would have been totally out of luck. Look, you're not here to buy our wares. We just assume you went somewhere else. But Jesus, here he's quoting from a couple of places, both from Isaiah and from Jeremiah, 
And he is saying, I think this is this is significant. It isn't just that the temple was to be called a house of prayer, but it was to be called a house of prayer for all nations. And he says, instead of that, you've made it a den of thieves. So Jesus had come here earlier. He had investigated what was going on, and he has come back the next day to cleanse it. Uh, if you're a um, an astute student of the scriptures, you you probably in your studies maybe of the Book of John. Book of John, there are two instances of this. There's an early one that actually happens in John chapter two, and then a latter one. You might wonder why would Jesus have to cleanse the temple twice? You know, it seems like this kind of action and reaction to what he sees would have made an impression on people. And I'm sure it did initially, but when you're chasing money, when, when you're more interested in your bottom line than you are in satisfying God's desire for you, if you're putting your possessions ahead, ahead of everything else like that rich young ruler did, then you might be upset for a time, but you know what? You're going to set up business again. And certainly that happened here. So Jesus had been there earlier, John chapter two, but he's come now again uh, for the Passover, which will ultimately result in his crucifixion. And here these religious merchants are again. Outward reform, that doesn't last. A person has to have their heart changed in, for it, in, in, in order for it to last. And so Jesus was calling for significant change, and it it just wasn't happening. Now, in his indictment against these leaders, Jesus, in quoting Isaiah and Jeremiah, is actually bringing to mind another time in their history when the very same kind of things were happening. Uh, both Isaiah and especially Jeremiah are distraught about the lack of commitment in worship to God, and especially in Jeremiah chapter 7, from which uh, Jeremiah's quotation is taken. In Jeremiah chapter 7, God says, let me remind you of what happened in Shiloh. And he's, of course, referencing that time when the religion uh, toward God had become so corrupt that actually the Ark of the Covenant had been taken out of its temporary uh, place uh, with the tabernacle under Eli's oversight, and Hophni and Phinehas, his sons, had taken it into battle and had lost it, not only lost the ark, but lost their lives, and ultimately Eli died too. But at that same time, um, Eli's grandson was being born, and the mother died in childbirth, but she named it Ichabod. And that's significant because the name Ichabod means the glory has left. And I think that ties pretty well these things together. That when, when God's people are not observant of him, when they've gone rogue, if you will, in terms of their practices, when they're doing those things which please themselves and not God, there comes a time when God just simply becomes fed up and in effect, his glory leaves. That's what Jeremiah was warning against, and that certainly is what is frustrating Jesus at this moment. He refers to them as a den of thieves. Of course, a, a den of thieves is basically the place to which the thieves go to hide when they've committed a crime. And so these religious leaders were using the worship God, worship of God as basically a cover for their sins. Well, we had that business with the fig tree, and I mean, we just we just basically had the description of it, and now we've gone to the temple, and as the day progresses, it ends. We start a new day. Well, what's on the horizon? They start traveling again. Verse twenty in the morning. As they passed by, oh, wait a minute. They saw that fig tree that they saw yesterday. They saw the fig tree. It was dried up. 
from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he asks. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. So Peter notices the fig tree, you know, just as you had said before, so it is now. Look, it's all dried up. And Jesus uses this miracle to teach his disciples some practical lessons about faith and about prayer, some things that we talked about yesterday, actually. Now, these mountains that he's talking about, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if Jesus had told the mountain to go up and be thrown into the sea or to be moved down the street, it would have, being the creator of all things. But mountains most likely represent, especially for us, great difficulties that need to be removed. And it's our faith in God that enables us to overcome those obstacles. Now, again, I would help us to keep in mind, and as was pointed out yesterday, God isn't just giving us a blank check and saying, hey, you know, whatever you want, just ask me, I'll give it to you. Well, it's not that. It isn't a wish list that we're just satisfying out of our own covetous nature or our, our inability to be satisfied, that's not what he's talking about at all. But those who are walking with God, when they ask for those things that benefit the accomplishment of the will of God, we ought to expect in faith that God is going to answer those prayers. And I would remind you again of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. That text says that whatever, that if you believe, you know, um, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is that you ask, you receive. If it's asked according to that text, according to his will, well, he hears us. When my will is lined up with God's will, there is no limit to the things that can be absolutely accomplished. Verse 25. The word and is a conjunction. That means that it just ties thoughts together. In, in this case, it's going to tie some sentences or, or paragraphs of thinking together. So this is continuing the thoughts, talking about you know, that fig tree. Wow, Peter's amazed that this has happened. And, and Jesus says, don't be amazed at that. You have faith. These kinds of things are going to be accomplished with you too. So he says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Seems to suggest, Jesus is, that even as great as your faith might be, faith isn't enough all by itself that you know at least in this category that we have to we have to forgive and extend grace to other people i mean it isn't just it isn't just the action and result that there's also a walk or a lifestyle that's going along with the kind of faith that moves mountains and he says, look, you know, we, we also have to have forgiveness toward others. Now, it isn't, you know, we're not reverse engineering this. It isn't that uh, we earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. No, God is a forgiving God. But we can certainly hinder our forgiveness if we do not have a forgiving heart toward other people. Forgiving others is something that shows that we have a a humble heart before God and that we recognize the value of our forgiveness and state before God, whether we consider the offense small or great, 
doesn't matter to God. An offense is an offense. So we come humbly to God and God is gracious in forgiveness. And he says just as much as that is true with you and your relationship with God, you must have the same kind of heart toward those who offend you, willing very quickly to forgive. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly want God forgiving me. <laughs> so uh, I'm very hard pressed to hold grudges against anybody just simply because, well, first of all, it's the right thing to do, forgiving. Secondly, uh, it is impossible to receive forgiveness from God when we are not of a forgiving spirit. Well, Jesus, when he spoke, you remember, there's already been some comments about that. When he spoke, he spoke with incredible authority. Uh, people heard what he had to say, and boy, they'd never heard that before. It, early on, that statement was made about Jesus. And you remember, I, I even pointed back to maybe his most famous sermon, that is the Sermon on the Mount, at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, People were amazed because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Jesus is already noted this way. And here he is in Jerusalem, the very seat of worship and spiritual activity of the religion of the time. It says that they came again to Jerusalem, verse 27. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. So here's the question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Hmm, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, Well, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, well, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. <laughs> We don't know. We don't know about his message where he where he got that his authority. So Jesus answered and said to them, "Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You can't get. If you don't get John, you'll never get me. That's the idea. So these religious leaders, I really hate calling them that, but that's what they were. These religious leaders, they were angry at what Jesus did and said and. They're really determined to destroy him. But first, they had to get enough evidence, you know, to bring charges against them, wanted to make it look legitimate. And it was all a question of authority. So what right did Jesus have to cleanse that temple and to call it his house? Because in claiming it as his house, he was in effect claiming to be God, and that wasn't going to go well. So Jesus took them back about three years, that time when John the Baptist was still living and ministering to the people. And Jesus asked them, you know, where, where did John get his authority for the baptism that he was doing? He was preaching then that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So was that from God or was it from men? Well, that puts them in a terrible dilemma. They didn't know how to answer. And they got themselves in a lot of trouble right here. Either they're going to be seen as weak and not responding to the will of God if they believed in him like the people did, or they're gonna have, have to answer to the people. And so maybe they had forgotten about their decision concerning John the Baptist, but Jesus hadn't forgotten. And it finally caught up with them. You see, when John had preached, they refused to submit to the message that John had preached. In John chapter, or not John, Luke, in Luke chapter seven, verses 29 and 30, it says that when all the people heard him, speaking of John the Baptist, when all of them heard him, 
even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But notice this, verse 30, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. What had happened then, Jesus is tapping, using right now. If they had not been ready to receive the message that John was preaching and act on it, then they weren't ready to receive what Jesus had either. In their unbelief and in their cowardice, they had even allowed John the Baptist to be killed by Herod Antipas, which we read about together. And soon they were even to ask Pilate to crucify Jesus. These people had no goodwill within them. And as a result, Jesus, Jesus seemingly had lost some patience with them. Instead of answering directly and upholding himself and his teaching, his authority, he basically condemned them by their own actions. Mark chapter 12. Then he began to speak to them in parables. Don't you like how, maybe you've noticed this, maybe you haven't, but there'll be sections of this book where it's a lot of action. He moves from place to place, has conversations with people, teaches uh, some tremendous lessons. Then maybe there will be a healing that breaks up the action there. And then there'll be a couple of parables. And more often than not, the disciples won't understand the parable. And so Jesus will go into a phase where he's explaining what it is that he meant. But it just seems like there is a, you know, an ebb and flow here. There's a lot of action. Then there's some reflection. Then there's some illustration by the miracles and such. And then we just kind of repeat that cycle over and over again. It says, uh, beginning here in verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1, then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, built a tower, and he leased it. Look now, he leased it, didn't sell it to him. He, re he retained ownership, but he leased it to the vine dressers and then went into a far country. So he's supposed to be now, he owns the property, but he's supposed to be making some money off of these people that are working on the property. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. In other words, they refused to pay. Again, he sent them another servant and at him, they threw stones, wounded him in the head, sent him away, shamefully treated, again, not paying. Again, he sent another. They killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, you know what? They might have done this to these other folks, but they'll respect my son, thinking they'll respect my son just as much as they respect me. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this right here is the heir. He's the one who's going to get the property if the owner dies. Come, let's kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Now, have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Haven't you read that? And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Now, <laughs> they may not have understood uh, understood all the implication of what was going on here, but they knew Jesus was talking about them. They could see close enough the analogy. Wait a minute. Is he basically telling us that God 
owned this vineyard and we've been squatters here and we've not paid due reverence and honoring glory to God. And now he sent prophets to us and tried to change our minds. And we, you know, first we refused him, then we killed him. Now they've sent the son. What? No, we don't accept. Get rid of Jesus. Well, I'm pretty sure they didn't gather all of that, but the parable's about that. The parable is about those Jews who have been so reluctant in their bearing of fruit to God and, and, and servicing the things of God. God had done everything for them and set them up in this land, given them everything their hearts could desire, and yet it wasn't enough. And they had become unfaithful. God had sent prophet after prophet in order to restore them to himself, but they refused and now at the very end, he has sent his son and they will refuse him too. When Jesus uses this by applying to himself these things, he is creating such an anger and an angst in the opposition that they are unwilling to uh, accept and ultimately will be motivated in effect to, to put him to death. And then Jesus goes a step further and he quotes from Psalm 118, which by the way is a messianic Psalm. When, when, when he quotes this about that chief cornerstone, by applying himself to the image of the cornerstone, Jesus was indeed affirming the fact that he is the Messiah. And to them, that is like the last straw, the ultimate blasphemy. And these guys are not going to let that go. Eventually, they're going to have him arrested, and they're not going to worry about the fear of the people. They will do their very best to sway the opinion of those that are witnesses to these actions such that they will be the ones out there in that crowd crying for his crucifixion. Well, the Pharisees and other, and I hate to say it, but religious leaders, <laughs> they are looking now to build a case against Jesus. What can we do to get him in trouble? Can we catch him in some of his teaching? Can we, can we get him to offend the Romans? Boy, if we could do that, then we would have it. That way his blood would not be on our hands. I mean, what can we do? You know, those mean old Romans, they came and got Jesus. So the Pharisees concoct this scheme with the Herodians that we had been introduced to a little bit earlier. Verse 13. Now, then they sent, the, the folks that Jesus just had this argument with, they're wanting to get rid of Jesus. So they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, he knows they're after him and they're trying to set him up. Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, and this is classic right here. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I'm, I'm going to take it. They marveled at him because, first of all, he had escaped their snare, their little trap. But also they said something that maybe these folks had never really thought about before. Now, first of all, the, the Pharisees, they oppose Rome. The Herodians, as we pointed out earlier, were basically a political party of Jews. 
they tended to cooperate with Rome. Normally, Pharisees and Herodians would be butting heads constantly and arguing and hating each other. But the thing that brought them together was their common enemy, Jesus. So the enemy of my enemy is my <laughs> friend. Interestingly, uh, the Greek word for catch that's right there in verse 13 it it conveys the image of a trap like like you're out there trying to hunt and you want to catch something you set a trap for it and that's what these guys were doing they were trying to set a trap for Jesus to step into with with his conversation but listen they're dealing with with God here and no human mind is going to be able to catch God in a situation wherein he is submissive to the man. It's just never going to happen and never did happen with Jesus, it, despite their best efforts. So this little committee from the Pharisees and the Herodians, they thought they could trap Jesus with a question that had both political and religious connotations to it. Now, knowing themselves to be God's chosen people, the Orthodox Jews, they didn't want to pay taxes to Rome. In fact, they did want to pay those taxes because that meant acknowledging that the Romans had power over them. You know, if you're paying taxes to a foreign nation, that means, wait a minute, they're not a foreign nation. They're our ruler. Jews didn't want to admit that. They were too proud. In fact, uh, in John 8, um, in that text, you know, they they try to claim to Jesus that they had never, ever been submissive or been servants or slaves to another nation. Well, of course, that was wrong historically, and it was wrong contemporarily. They were under Roman domination. So here, here are folks who are just bound and determined to make the point that they're not in servitude, so they wouldn't need to or wouldn't be responsible to pay taxes. But here's Jesus approving the paying of taxes to Rome. Now, normally he'd be in trouble with his own people. And he'd be in trouble with Rome too. What are you gonna do? Pay the taxes, not pay the taxes? That was the ultimate question. So knowing this is a trap, Jesus, and he just uses very, very uh, powerful argument. He replied in a way that not only avoided the dilemma that he was in, in choosing one side or another, but he actually drove home to his questioners the responsibility that they have to the state. And it's this. You know, if you have that Caesar's coin in your hand, it means you must be using Caesar's coins. So since they're using Caesar's coins, by virtue of the fact that they're using that currency, they're admitting that Caesar does have authority over them, at least over their money. And when they paid their taxes, all that they were doing was giving back to Caesar what he had given them in the first place. Now, taxes aren't like a, a gift to the government. Taxes are a debt that we pay. We pay this debt of taxes in return for the services that the government renders. I'm not altogether sure about what the Romans experienced. I know they had roads that went everywhere. I know that especially in uh, the capital city, there was a dole of bread that went out to those who were less fortunate. I mean, there are a lot of things that that money was spent on in terms of infrastructure and support. It also provided necessary monies for the army to provide protection and the peace that they experienced. In our own time, at least where I am, when I pay taxes, I know that out of those taxes, I have a police protection. I have a fire protection in the form of a fire department, men whose job it is to put out fires in our community. 
There are social agencies uh, for the less fortunate. There is the defense of our uh, city and state and nation. All of those things that are benefits to the citizens of a country actually come out of the taxes. But at the same time, the image of God is stamped on each human. I mean, we were created literally in the image of God. And so as much as I would pay back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, his coins, so much so Jesus makes the point that I also have to pay back to God the things that are God's. And the number one thing on the list that is God's is actually me. Now, there's an interesting twist in all that for the Christian and, you know, passages like Romans chapter 13 that talks about God establishing human government for our good and our being obliged to respect officials and obey the law would certainly include all the things that Jesus uh, said about the taxes and so forth. But the interesting twist there is that if I am the person who has God's image stamped on him, if I owe God everything, then I certainly also owe him obedience to the things that he dictates. <laughs> and, and among other things, one of the things that he dictates is my um, recognition and my respect for those who are in even secular authority over me. Just kind of an interesting twist. Uh, that Jesus makes on what was otherwise supposed to be a trap becomes a, a powerful theological discussion about how one who is a dis disciple of God uh, actually interacts with other authorities that are established on, on earth. Well, in verse 18, so we, we've been talking about chief priests and, and scribes and so forth We've been talking about Pharisees in particular and the scribes. Now we're talking about another sect of Judaism referred to as the Sadducees. Actually, I think uh, in the book of Mark, I think this is the only time that they are actually called out by name, the Sadducees. It says that some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. And then they're going to lay down this scenario. He said, Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So all the way to the seventh, seven brothers had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, and of course, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they think they're really trapping him with this one. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. I'm, I'm going to guess that this was probably one of the, you know, when people have doctrines that are different from what you read in scripture, they always have one of these gotcha arguments, like, I bet you didn't think about this, and this is, this is what we're talking about right here. So these guys are like, well... I know you believe in the resurrection. We don't believe in the resurrection. So here's a good example of why you shouldn't believe in it. But Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven, are like doesn't say they are angels. It says they are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, 
have you not read in the book of Moses? He knows that they did because they believed in those early books, certainly the first five books. He said, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You not read that? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. <laughs> I, what? You know what? I would, even if, even if I was right and it ultimate, ultimately found out I was right, wouldn't you be afraid to go to Jesus with one of your arguments about what you think the Bible means and says? I would be, <laughs> even though, I, you know, I'm generally pretty confident about things that I believe. I, if Jesus were here and I were, I were given the responsibility to try and teach him something that I found in the scriptures, <laughs> I would be terrified because Jesus is like, and these Sadducees are supposed to be the great leaders. All of the, the, the high priest and the priest, they were Sadducees. And so these are like the top level, the top tier um, keepers of the law. And so they come to Jesus like, oh, we got you now. And Jesus says, don't you know what the Bible says? haven't you read? And then haven't you read this over here about Moses? It is like you guys are so ignorant. The only place where Mark mentions them, and I'm not surprised that they didn't come back after this, um, they, they were people who accept authority, but they only accepted the authority that they found in the first five books of Moses. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the body coming up out of the grave and being reunited with the spirit. They didn't believe in the existence of angels. But over here in Deuteronomy 25, they had this little, little uh, description of what's called the kinsman redeemer. And so if, you know, back then, a lot of, especially your property was tied to the number one male in the family, uh, the firstborn. A double portion always went to him. And it was important that he bear children and that there be a line of succession. So if he dies, then the property goes to the son. Well, we have a family dilemma here. We've got the firstborn son who marries a woman but he gets sick and doesn't bear any children. Oh no, property rights are, are in question. What are we going to do? Well, solution, take the number two son, marry him to her. And then when she has children, those children will basically be then thought of as the offspring of the first son. And so then we can continue the line of succession and then they're, they're the ones who'll get the property. But turns out the second one died too before he ever had any children. And the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one and the seventh one. And then the woman died, never had any children. So the line of succession ended right there. And since, since no one ended up with children and continued the line, the question is, since there wasn't any continuation, she could actually be wife to any of them. Which one? And Jesus said, well, one thing you don't understand about the scriptures is that when in the resurrection, there is no marriage. So the question of her being married to somebody, that's not even a thing. And then secondly, what you don't understand is you were trying to trap me about the matter of resurrection, and you don't even know the scriptures that you read yourself. Didn't you read that God is and not was, but is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Don't you know that God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead? They might be in the grave, but that's not the end of it. Why? Because there is life after death and therefore a hope of future re resurrection. But resurrection is not reconstruction and the continuation of life as it is now, which maybe was the mess that they had in their own mind. How could this be? God's children aren't going to become angels, but he says that we're going to become like angels in the sense that it's a spiritually based existence, 
and not like the one that we have now. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, in fact, I don't want to be an angel, do you? Because in that text, it says that we will be like Jesus. I'd very much rather be like Jesus than be like an angel. Uh, you'll need to study the book Hebrews to get the gist of all of that. But that aside, we're going to be like them in the sense that we don't marry or we don't have families. It's going to be a whole new kind of of life. And that is something that the Sadducees themselves just absolutely did not grasp. And I, I take it, that's probably why we don't have them <laughs> mentioned anymore in this book, because boy, Jesus just shut that whole thing down right there. Verse 28, we get the other guys back now. Sadducees had their shot. Oh, you blew it. You didn't do good. How about we'll give it another shot? And so one of the scribes came. And having heard them, so he was listening to all of this. Having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all. Now, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do as I'm reading through it. Almost always I'm thinking about how people are trying to trap Jesus. I, I This is just me. I'm not saying it has to be you. You can stay on the track where they're looking for reasons to get Jesus. But I don't, I don't see that here. I see somebody, a scribe, somebody who's in the word of God all the time. He's kind of standing on the side there. He's with his friends, but maybe he doesn't have any anything, any role to play in this trapping business, but he hears, here's what's going on. And he's perceiving Jesus's grasp of the word. And so he's like, you know, in his own mind, he's like, boy, one of the big questions that I wrestle with is what's the best commandment? I bet Jesus knows. And so he just comes out with it, which is the first commandment of all. Jesus answered him. First of all, the commandment is what a lot of people refer to as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, all the soul, all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, now, by the way, stop right there. Jesus didn't see that he answered in, you know, avoiding what Jesus had said or Boy, he's angry now because Jesus messed up the trap that he has set. Nothing like that. It says that when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty wise. <laughs> Don't question Jesus. Jesus will, Jesus will unravel your little argument. So Pharisees, whether this was a sincere heart or not, tried one more time. They sent this scribe. I, I tend to think that he had a good heart about it, but who's to say? He's been debating a long time and What's the deal? What's the great commandment? I can understand their struggle because if you, and maybe you've done this already in your studies, but you go through those early books, first five books in particular, 
I don't, I, I have never sat down to try and actually number them and add them up. But there are people who do things like that. And so I researched it and I hope that these figures are accurate. If they're not exactly right, they're certainly very close. There are at least, I would say it that way, there are at least 613 separate unique commandments that are found in the law. 613. 365 of them, which is one for every day of the year, by the way, 365 of them are negative. They go along the line of thou shalt not do this or that. 248 of them are positive. That is, God commands that we do something positively. So 365 negative, thou shalt not. 248 positive, you shall do this or that, comes to 613 commandments. So which one of those out of 613, is the most important. That's what the guy is asking Jesus. And Jesus replies with the Shema, uh, the, the traditional Jewish statement of faith found in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Most Jews recited that thing every morning and every evening. They also added Leviticus 19 and verse 18, that if we love God, that we'll show it by loving our neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said those two things that everybody is so familiar with, and they practice it every day. That is the root of it all. Well, at least one of the scribes gets the message clearly and boldly, and Jesus agrees. The others, I suppose, miss the point completely. In fact, they had such a shallow view of the real meaning of the law and had failed to understand it to the degree that they were not willing to obey it from the heart. That's why I think that they become, according to this, very frustrated to the extent that they don't even want to ask him any more questions because every time they ask him a question, he turns it such that he condemns some practice, or attitude that they are manifesting in their lives. And you know, if, if you are, if you're the unrepentant sort, if you're the kind of person who just doesn't receive instruction very well, and in this case, you don't receive instruction from God very well, then there comes a point at which, you know what, you're not even you're not even willing to talk about it anymore. I just don't want to hear it. And you turn your back on God. That's what these folks were effectively doing with Jesus, just turning their back on his powerful and, well, it's already been acknowledged several times, his authoritative teaching. Well, Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it? that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David. Now, I want to remind us, it wasn't but just a couple of days ago in this text that Jesus comes into Jerusalem and the people are crying out to him, Hosanna to the son of David. Save us, son of David. So Jesus is now he's trying to incite them, trying to provoke them a little bit. So we're here, you know, we're in the temple. We're reading the scriptures. And Jesus offers this provocative question. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Please grasp the significance of this. Jesus says, 
Okay. David referred to him as his Lord. And then the Lord, God, says to my Lord, David speaking of the one greater than himself, sit at my right hand. Wait, what? Tell him make your enemies your footstool. David himself calls him Lord. How can, how can he then be his son if he's his Lord? Well, Jesus asked what is the final and the most important question. And from here on out, there's not going to be any more discussion. He rode into the city. He was being called the son of David right there by the crowds. The children echoed that very same cry in the temple. Matthew chapter 21, verse 15. This is a messianic title. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows that the Messiah is the son of David. And that's why the Pharisees wanted to get him to shut up. They wanted to silence the people. Quit talking about him that way. So quoting from Psalm 110, Jesus asked them to explain. You explain how David's Lord could also be David's son. And they couldn't answer that. The answer, of course, is that David's Lord had to become a man. A son is a descendant. This Lord would be a descendant of David. The theologians, the religious leaders, they refuse to face the implications of both the question and the answer. Their knowledge of the word of God was so shallow and its practical application to the events that were unfolding right there before our eyes. They were unwilling to admit it. And certainly their submission to the word of God in this particular instance was very insecure. They may say that they are students of the word, scribes in fact, but they were not servant to the word that was being spoken. And so Jesus, he said to them in his teaching, right there in the midst of them, with this question just hanging up there unanswered, he said to them in his teaching, while he's doing the teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Woo! Jesus ended the debate with a warning, an example, both of which exposed the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his time. Oh, they walk around here looking like they are somebody and demand respect, but they take for themselves and they make a pretense in the very presence of God with their long prayers. They're the ones, Jesus says, who will receive the greater condemnation. And imagine, if you will, so Jesus is doing this teaching, and he's just brought down the great leaders of their time who are filled with all this hypocrisy, had made these attacks against Jesus. And Jesus is doing this teaching now. Get that image in your mind. Verse 41 says that he sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, surely I say to you that this widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now, why is this statement right here? It is set in contrast, isn't it, to the image that Jesus just painted for us of who the scribes are. They make themselves out to be somebody 
And in effect, he says they steal from the widows. And then he uses that in order to point out, oh, yeah, and by the way, right there's a widow. Let me tell you something about what she's putting there into that treasury. She's put in more than everybody else. And the reason why is because she's given her entire livelihood. And those hypocrites wouldn't think of doing such a thing. Reminds me of what we saw earlier with that rich young ruler, right? What is it that's really getting in the way? It isn't, it isn't really how much the figure of possessions, but the mindset that whatever it is that I have is the Lord's. When you contrast, Sorry. yes, go ahead. Yeah, is it is it Colossians that says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil? Yeah, First Timothy six. Yeah, oh, the yeah. love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He says, for which some have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of those things. You know, it just creates issues. But this is even bigger than that. You know, this is this is not just uh, whether I have too much or not. The, the issue here is whether I give all of myself or not. And really, that th this whole this whole series of thought really kicked off with the discussion about what's the greatest commandment. It's loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said the second in, second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. The second like it in the sense that when I love my neighbor, I'm also loving him with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. So I love God and I love others with all that I have. And then he looks around him and he says, you know, right here is an issue that can settle a lot of the questions that you might have spiritually. Look at these spiritual leaders. Do they love others with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do they demonstrate their love of God with all that they have? You can measure that out right here at the treasury. They're supposedly by their giving, giving to God. Question, who's given more? That great scribe right there or that rich Pharisee? Or is it this widow here, this humble, lowly person? Most people would say, well, it's the religious leaders, of course. And look how much they give. They're so impressed with the volume of giving. However, relatively, the widow had given way more than they had because okay, it says she gave her entire livelihood. In effect, in this analogy, she gave it all. She gave it all. So when you contrast the conduct of the widow and that of the scribes, you really see what God values the most. Now, this isn't this isn't within the scope of our studies here, but I, you know, if you want if you want to see a row, you want to see. Jesus really let these people have it, then, you know, in your spare time, you might go over and read Matthew chapter 23, because in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus absolutely condemns the behavior, the attitude, the mindset of the very people that have now shut their mouths against Jesus. This might be the end of it here in the book of Mark, but boy, Matthew 23 just is very powerful. So I would encourage you, just in connection with that, to, to read that text. Okay, that's heavy stuff. So let's go to something light, like the prediction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, trying to be funny here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I bow and thank you so much. Okay. Mark chapter 13. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Isn't this amazing? These buildings. Wow. And history 
uh, indicates absolutely that was true. These were marvelous structures. But Jesus answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another. Thou shall not be thrown down. I, I remember um, the reason this is fresh on my mind. I just recently went through a study here in Boonville through Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And all of those prophets, referred to as major prophets, but all of those prophets spoke to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple during the time of the Babylonian captivity. Babylonians came in, they destroyed everything. God's presence left the temple and that temple was destroyed. And it, it was a dark time. During that time, when, when especially when Jeremiah and Ezekiel, because they were there during the time of the departure of God's presence, when that, when that temple was on the block to be destroyed, it, it was described as ultimately being a desolate place. And that's exactly what's being described here. In fact, Daniel was a part of that too. And not only did he indicate what was happening in his own time, but ultimately as it foreshadowed what was to come. And you know, talked about desecration with abomination within the temple complex itself. That time that was being both contemporary with those writers, but also anticipated in the future was about to happen. And Jesus was going to warn his people about that. Verse three, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So four of the disciples, the, the, the closer ones, Peter, Andrew, James, they ask when it was that this destruction of the temple was going to take place. When, when's it going to be destroyed and what sign would announce this disastrous event? Of course, they thought that the destruction of the temple, the end of the age and the coming of the kingdom were all going to be the same thing. But Jesus, in answering them, explains it in general course of the last days in the sense that, well, there'll be this event and then this and then this. His greatest concern was that his people not be deceived by false Christs that were going to appear and promise to lead them to victory and glory. He was the only one on the scene. And it does seem like in the first century, um, especially when the question regarding 
the influence of Christianity had come along, Gamaliel said, look, if there's nothing to this, then it will destroy itself. But if there is something to it, then who can stand against God? Even at that time, there were many who said they were the Christ, but were not. And so he was pointing out that there were going to be coming a lot of false signs that would lead people astray and warning them not to fall prey to that. This admonition, of course, related primarily to the Jews because they had a lot invested in what was going on with that temple. The church had to watch out for false teachers. We know about that. Peter, Peter encourages that in 2 Peter chapter 2. But in this setting, he's not talking about just false preachers. He said there are going to come a time before the destruction of this place that false Christs are going to come into the scene. There are going to be a lot of people follow after them. Don't you fall prey to that. So times of persecution were times for proclamation. And he said, before any of that happens, we've got to assert ourselves and get the gospel out there. Preach it to the world. So verse 14, when you see, it's kind of changing his Two now, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken about Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, I want to stop right there. In other words, when you see something happen there here in this temple complex, something that seems totally and completely out of place, something that is unimaginable, and by the way, the Romans would march into Jerusalem in AD 70, and they would march themselves right there into that temple, a place that had all of its components that were supposed to be separated from the Gentile presence, and they would desecrate that place, something that was totally unimaginable for decades before, centuries before, the abomination of desolation would have occurred. That is a time when, just as in uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel's time that the presence of the Lord had left, it would have left here as well. God had left this temple complex and returned his mechanism of spiritual things to heaven, and it would return no more. So verse 15, when that happens, he says, let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, never ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you at that time, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is here, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, see, I have told you these things. Now, why is it that in that time that Christ wouldn't be present? Well, it's because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection would have already taken place. Jesus was shortly about to die on that cross. The church would be established in about A.D. 33. The gospel would be preached, according to Colossians 1, verse 23, to every nation, to every creature under heaven. This abomination, this desolation of that temple place was to occur, well, it would occur, in 70 AD, AD 70, about 40 years later, a period of time in which Judaism was waning, but the gospel was being preached in the hopes that Judaism would turn to Christ. That gospel would also be preached to the whole world, to Gentiles, just as Jesus was prophesying here. But ultimately, that presence would leave Jerusalem, would leave that temple, God's presence among his people would be with their hearts and not in the stone fortifications like the temple was. And that final act of God in the destruction of Jerusalem 
and the tearing down of that temple would be the ultimate end of Judaism and the freedom, I guess, of expression for Christianity everywhere. Historically, it's interesting to note that while Judaism suffered its most serious blow in AD 70, that very few, if any Christians of note, died in Jerusalem at that time. And why is that? It's because Jesus had warned them of what was about to come. He said, when you see these things start happening, you need to get out of town. You need to, you know, even if you left something in the house, don't go down there and go get it. Run to the mountains because the destruction is nigh. This abomination of des desolation uh, Daniel talks about, and probably in your study of Daniel, that'll be pointed out to you. It was a warning to Jews in Judea that the time was nigh. It was time to get out. Doesn't have anything to do with the ultimate end of time. Uh, people manipulate these things of Jesus and those prophecies so much. This is not what we're reading about, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians 4, where Jesus comes in the clouds. That's not what being described here. It's not uh, what we find in 2 Peter, where we have the return and the destruction of the world. But Jesus says, verse 24, after that, after that destruction of Jerusalem, after the, you know, the siege on Jerusalem by those Romans, that terrible time of tribulation. He said the sun, it'll be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now, there is something to look forward to after uh, a, all these things had taken place. Yes? Sorry. It's exactly what I wanted to say. Up to verse 23, it is hardships and tribulation and destruction. And then verse 24 to 27 is jubilation and magnification and, yes. you know, and glory. Yeah, so, so many... Well, so many people do what these disciples had done. They jumble all of it together. And Jesus says, no, no, you, you're misunderstanding again. Here's what happens. And then he begins to answer the questions in sequence. In fact, he uses a parable, and I think it's beautiful. He uses a parable to try to explain what it is that he's just described for them, beginning at verse 28. He said, you know, you can, you can learn the parable of this fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer's near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. He said, as surely I said to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So as regards the events of the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, it is like when you look at the fig tree. You see the signs of that. You can know that it's about to bear fruit. Summer's here and we can get ready. He said, with regard to this destruction right here, you can know, and apparently they did know, and evacuated the city. But he says, verse 32, speaking concerning the end time, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. 
Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest, coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Have you read, and, and I don't know if you've studied um, First, Thessal First Thessalonians or not. Have you read First Thessalonians chapter 5? In chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, he describes the end, the coming of the Lord, when there is the gathering of the righteous to himself in the air. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, he describes that same time period, but it's very different from the un, for the ungodly who are engulfed in flame. But I want to keep this positive. <laughs> so in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. The idea is that we maintain our faithfulness. We don't know when the Lord is going to return, but we can know this moment right here, and we can know that if the Lord were, were to return right now, he would find us faithful. So that means that whatever moment we are in, that we should always be ready. Never let our guard down. The important thing is not watching the calendar, <laughs> but building our character, being certain that we are always the person that we were called to be, being faithful to the Lord. We have to be alert, we have to watch, we have to be found doing his work when he comes. Can I, I also think, say, yes. Sorry, can I also say that look, we all die. Um and some some people unexpectedly, like my neighbor died, just died. First of all, yeah. You know? Um, yeah. and nobody expected it. So but it is for him the Lord has come. Oh, Do you know what I mean? Yes. yes. You know? So um so live each day as it is your last day, because it doesn't matter when the big cloud drifter's Lord comes. It is when you die, then you don't have a chance anymore anyway. So yeah. then the Lord has come for you. <laughs> uh, absolutely right. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, when I was a little child in um we call it elementary school. I'm I'm not sure what you guys call your early your early grades, but primary it elementary school. What what'd you say? Primary school. Primary school. Okay. Well, when I was in primary school, you know, I remember having you would have an exam or whatever that you're looking to. <laughs> I remember thinking, boy, I, I hope the Lord returns now so I don't have to take that test. <laughs> That's <laughs> the simple thoughts of a child. And sometimes even even we. Like at the at the end of the book of Revelation, you know, John, who was relating these images in that book, at the conclusion, he is like, you know, even so calm, Lord Jesus. He's like, Lord, just please come now. Well, I think people have been crying out like that for a long time, probably since John did it. They've done it on and on. Even children who are facing tests pray that the Lord will come soon so they don't have to to say the test, see the test. And my whole point of that is that it always seems like, and, and I think this point was so well made, is that oftentimes we think about looking forward to when it will be and being ready and getting things lined up for when it will be as though it's always in the future. 
But you and I, we don't know if we're going to take our next breath. We don't know if the heart's going to keep beating. And for us, it's not going to be that, you know, that image of the Lord coming in the clouds and the angels and all of that. It's just going to be we will cease to breathe and we will uh, be somehow or other transformed into a new existence. For us, the end will have come at the end of our physical living. So whether that time is the glorious return of the Lord in the air, and wouldn't that be amazing to experience, or whether it is simply the transition from this life into the next, the truth is no matter when it is, we need to be ready. Yes or no? Amen. Yes. Yes, yes. So we'll just we'll just go ahead and make this pack together, right? We're going to be ready, aren't we? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. Oh, I should have called roll today. <laughs> no, that. We want to be ready whenever that time comes. Absolutely. Okay. Mark chapter 14. You know, after all this, they are ready to kill Jesus. Uh, before it's trap him, maybe we can get him to say something that will get the Romans' attention and they'll put him in jail and just get him out of our hair. Uh, we could get him in big trouble that way. Or... We want the people to turn against him. Maybe they won't listen to his teaching anymore, but everything they try to do to get Jesus to stop speaking, it hasn't worked. When you get to the place where you're as frustrated as these people are, they're losing the attention of their own people. Jesus is humiliating them now with his powerful arguments, you become, and, and it's hard to imagine that a person would get this so upset, but these folks will get so upset that they are going to try to find a way to put him to death. And think about, think about that. This isn't the thugs of his time. These aren't the, these aren't the evildoers uh, the the people that are hiding in the shadows, the 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 robbers on the road that that isn't the group we're we're talking about the people who, before Jesus came along, were the examples of holiness. These were the people who who teach in the temple the word of God. These are scribes who read God's word all day and all night. Th these are these are the people who conducted all the religious um, ceremonies. These are the people who taught the law and indicated those things that were sins before God. These were the people that we were supposed to look up to, like the Pharisees, so, so pure and so righteous that when they walked in a crowd, the crowd just divided so that they didn't touch them for fear that they might defile them in so, some way. These are the people who we're supposed to look up to. It says in verse 1, chapter 14, that after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, and by the way, you haven't caught on yet, not so much in Mark, I don't think, because it hasn't been stressed that much, but it certainly is stressed a lot in, for instance, the book of John, where Jesus, when he just wanted to get away wanted to spend time with friends in basically some quiet surroundings, just, just time to get off his feet a little bit, he would go to Bethany. 
he would spend time, especially with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Those seem to be very close friends living there in Bethany. But he's in Bethany, and he's at the house of Simon the leper. As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. I, I'm going to think that um, Simon the leper is actually someone that, you know, he had already gotten this nickname because he was a leper, but most likely this is someone Jesus had healed. And so, you know, he's able to associate with people again. And so he's at his house and he's sitting at the table, Jesus is, and a woman came having an alabaster flask a very costly oil of spikenard. Then he, she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among them and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Now, we don't learn it here in this text, but, you know, Judas is one of those who was questioning the waste. In fact, those are practically his very words. But Jesus said in verse 6, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do to them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Okay, so this event, actually according to Matthew 26, John 12, actually it took place before the triumphal entry, but Mark actually places it here without giving a time reference. John does, John chapter 12, so this is something that's a little bit out of place. You might wonder, well, well, why is that? Because if I were writing the book, I'd put everything in the exact order. But um, you have to keep in mind that at the time that this was written, I mean, that wasn't necessarily important. What's important is relating the story and then relating the story in such a way as to combine elements. And you, you, I think you really saw that, I hope you did, in chapter 13. Remember, every time we talked about one thing, we referenced something that had already happened because all of those things built together in order to relate a great truth about Jesus. This event taking place uh, really just a few days ago is is describing for us, you know, the, the ultimate presentation of Jesus. He isn't dead yet, but the preparations uh, for his body, in other words, otherwise, as events are going to unfold very quickly, that's already set in place. It's already taken place. It's kind of like, you know, when Jesus is going for the triumphal entry, well, where is he going to get the cult to ride in? Oh, well, that's already been set in motion. That thing's been tied up and is waiting for the two disciples to come and retrieve it. So here we have all the preparations being made. I, I don't know who Simon the leper was. Probably, like I said, somebody that Jesus had healed and who's home now, probably forever, as long as possible, is going to be open to the master. 
That was true of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the Jesus. You know, aside from the fact that he's the son of God, he he's a good man. He's making friends and he is endearing himself to a lot of people. Now, Mary, we find out from John 12, her act of love in using this oil is accepted by Jesus. But Judas and the other disciples, they criticized it. In John chapter, John chapter 12, uh, verses 4 to 6, it says, But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared about the poor people, because he was a thief and he had the money box. He was used to taking money out of it. He was, you know, he's thinking, wow, we could have put that money in this box. I'd get that. During the Passover, the Jews, well, they did try to help the poor. And Jesus wasn't opposed, of course, to helping the poor. That's not the point of this. The ointment, it was expensive. Uh, some estimates are that oil like this might have cost in upwards of a year's wages. If you'd have sold that, no doubt about it. It would have fed a lot of poor people, no question. But Mary... Mary wanted to anoint Jesus in preparation for his death and his burial. And in this setting, that was more important than feeding the poor. And Jesus makes what's a powerful statement, and that is, and, and I've referenced this a lot of times, you know, you'll always have poor people. There will always be somebody that you can bless. You can do good then. Right now, right now is the time to think about what's coming. Now, her good work glorified God, and it was a blessing to the whole world. But I, I noticed some wordplay here that I wanted to investigate a little bit, and I thought it kind of stringed these accounts together because we don't, here in Mark, we don't even mention who these people are like we did in John. The word waste, that's in verse 4, the question of wasting that oil. That word waste is taken from a Greek word that is translated in other places by the word perdition, okay? Waste and perdition both come out of the same word. In John chapter 17 and verse 12 is one place where it's used. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition was Judas. Okay, now isn't this ironic? Just put this together. So the same word translated perdition there in John 17, verse 12, is translated as the word waste in verse 4, which is a word that comes right out of Judas's mouth. Judas is afraid of the waste that would come out of this gift because he wanted the money. But he ultimately would become the son of perdition, the son of waste in John chapter 17 and verse 12. It was Judas, in other words, after that long explanation, it was Judas who was the waster and not Mary. Mary was doing a good thing. Ironically, the very words of Judas condemn him. He wasted his God-given opportunities, and eventually he wasted his life, ending it by committing suicide. And I... Yes. Sorry, I just had two light bulb moments. The oh, good. One is, <laughs> the one is... Um, Right after Jesus like rebuked him um, in verse um, 6 to 9, verse 10 went ahead and he says, 
Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief, went to the chief priest. They didn't come to him to yeah. betray him. And they paid him, okay? Yes. Or they promised to pay him. Again, his focus was on money. Yes. That was the one thing I was thinking. And then the other one was, um, I like your wastage uh, message, though. But the other one was, if you take an Ananias and Sapphira, Paul yes. said to them, was not your money yours to do what you want with? I mean, this oil, it was Mary's to do what she wants with. Judas <laughs> yeah. didn't have didn't have a right to complain about what she chose with her money. Absolutely. Those are, yeah, those are great points. And that uh, what you said about Judas, that, that also helped me have a light bulb moment. And, and that was, you know, Judas apparently that for judas this is the last straw you know we've been waiting on this kingdom and hadn't come i'm thinking about how i might profit in this i'm not getting the money that i want what am i doing with my life following this guy and he's giving away everything and now he rebukes me in front of all these people i can't take it and so it's like you know what okay you want a kingdom? We'll see if it happens, and I'll just turn you in, and I'll make money off of you. It's like, wow, this thing, this the wheels come off of this pretty fast, don't they? I um, I have a, a, um, a theory that Judas thought, like all Jews, that Jesus was going to establish a uh, um, earthly kingdom. Yeah, right? this worldly kingdom. And yeah. he he was already the treasurer. So he was thinking in this new kingdom, he would be minister of finance. <laughs> like a very... <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so he was just seeing all his future plans go to... Oh, I know. To... Yeah. Uh, that's what happens when we put ourselves first. Uh, did yeah. someone else have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say something when you said, uh, sorry, Brother Ken, no, about wastage. Um, yes. When they gave him the, so the 15 coins for betraying Jesus, when he went back and he realized his mistake, the religious leaders would not take the money, but what did they go and do? They bought the potter's field, <laughs> which is a wasteland. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Yes. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for that. This just, isn't this fun? It um, is. It, it is great. Listen, our time is up and I have a little test for you. Just a little thing. You'll love it. Simple. Um, hope you do well on it. And hey, we meet Thursday, right? So you have a night off and then Thursday will be our last class here in the book of Mark. So we'll look forward to finishing up the book and seeing the triumphant ending. And uh, Lord willing, um, time will go quick like it did today. I hope you have a successful testing and I'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of days. Okay. Thank, Thank you, brother. All Thank right. All right. You're welcome. Thank you all for all the light bulbs that went off tonight. And, <laughs> night, uh, night, everybody. Yeah, you're giving please. me a lot of good, fun things to think about. Uh, I love you all and hope the best for you. Talk to you later. Love you. Bye bye. Good night.